Welcome, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today in this event. Um, my name is Daniel Holoy. I am a senior policy advisor at Amnesty International, and it's a real honor to be here today um, for a conversation with you all. Um, together with IDPC and CELS, we put together this event to analyze the increasing risks and challenges that civil society organizations and human rights defenders are facing in their respective countries because of the so-called war on drugs. Uh, we have seen how in, in recent years, civil society organizations and human rights defenders are facing increasing risks and challenges for speaking out against injustice and standing up for human rights around the world. Human rights defenders across the globe are facing an onslaught of harassment, intimidation, ill treatment, restrictions, unjust prosecutions and detention simply for speaking of for human rights. Thousands of human rights defenders have been killed uh, or forcibly disappeared by state and non-state actors and far from being recognized and protected by the state, there are, there are, they are often portrayed as criminals, undesirables, foreign agents, anti-nationals, or even terrorists. The so-called war on drugs has been a particular driver of threats and attacks against human rights defenders. The increase in powerful non-state actors um, and armed groups um, and the rising levels of violence have created an increasingly complex context for human rights defenders at a time when states are imposing more restrictions on civil society. Organized crime, um, as you all know, uh, poses a, a risk to human rights defenders as criminal groups often use violent methods to establish control over their territory and will retaliate against anyone who gets on their way. Likewise, state attempts to clamping down on such criminal networks, particularly when, when these strategies are militarized, or when officials act in collusion with criminal groups can also create a dangerous environment in which human rights defenders risk being targeted both by state and non-state actors. From journalists who have exposed the collusion between authorities and organized crime to human rights defenders exposing abu abuses committed by the security forces during counter-narcotic operations, um, to drug policy reform activists, dr doctors and healthcare providers um, all of them, all these human rights defenders, have been facing challenges because of current drug policies. Today, we will hear from three amazing human rights defenders who have found themselves at the front line of such attacks in different regions of the world. Each of them will tell us about the work they and their organizations have been doing to promote and defend human rights in the midst of the war on drugs, and about the threats and attacks they have faced because of this work. Let me just say as well that this year marks the 20th anniversary of the UN Declaration of Human Rights Defenders. And this presents an important opportunity for us all to reflect on these issues. We hope that throughout this discussion, we will be able to explore how current drug control poses specific race risks to human rights defenders, but also to explore the opportunities for increasing their protection at the national, regional, and international level, including through specific action taken by UN agencies based here in Vienna. Um, today, we will hear first from Maricela Orozco from Mexico. Uh, Maricela has been defending human rights since Mexico's bloody security strategy brought tragedy, tragedy to her life. In 2014, two of his young kids were killed. One of them remained disappeared for more than three years. While searching for his son in a context where more than 30,000 people remained disappeared in Mexico, she got together with other families who are also searching for the, for the whereabouts of their loved ones. Together, they founded the organization Families of the Search Maria Herrera, and later they established the National Network of Families of People Forcibly Disappeared. Her work in the search for the disappeared and against the militarization of public security in Mexico has put her at grave risk, forcing her to leave the city where she lived with her family. Later, we will hear from Eliezer Carlos, or Budit, who is a human rights defender from the Philippines, who has been at the forefront of the response against the violent anti-drug strategy that began since President Duterte took power in 2016 and declared a war on drugs, in which police and vigilantes have killed thousands of alleged drug offenders in what, in what may constitute crimes against <coughs> humanity. Budit is also the, spo is the spokesperson of the organization In Defense of Human Rights and Dignity Movement, or IDEFEND, and the Deputy Secretary General of the Philippine Alliance of Human Rights Advocates. 
And to finalize, we will, we will hear from Peter Sarozzi, a human rights activist and drug policy expert from Hungary. He is the executive director of the Rights Reporter Foundation and previously worked with the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union. His organization is among the many NGOs affected by recent Hungarian laws targeting civil society that restrict the right of organizations to seek and utilize resources from foreign sources. Um, a law that is highly stigmatizing against NGOs and human rights defenders and that is making even more difficult for these organizations to support the marginalized communities they, which they work for, including people who use drugs. Um, so without further talk, I will stop myself and I will give the, the microphone and the, and the floor to Maricela. Maricela will speak in Spanish and I will be doing translation as, as she moves on. Buenos días, mi nombre es Maricela Orozco. Estoy aquí porque desgraciadamente sufrí el secuestro de mi hijo Gerson, estudiante de arquitectura de 19 años, y el asesinato de mi hijo Alan, de tan solo 15 años, estudiante de prepa y, y joven profesional del fútbol, y el asesinato de mi yerno Miguel. Good morning. My name is Maricela Orozco. I come from Mexico. I am here today because, unfortunately, my kid, Gerson, of 19 years old, was kidnapped a little bit more than three years ago. And that same day, uh, my son, Alan, who, who was an architecture student, and my son-in-law, um, Miguel, were also killed when they were looking for Gerson. Mi hijo Gerson fue desaparecido en el marco de la violencia e impunidad que genera la guerra contra las drogas en México. Esta guerra ha consistido en la militarización de la seguridad pública, resultado de un aumento de violencia a los derechos humanos y alcanzando una cifra oficial de más de 30 mil personas desaparecidas desde el 2006. My son Gerson was disappeared in the context of the violence and impunity that the war on drugs has brought to Mexico. This war has consisted in the militarization of public security, resulting in the increase of violence and human rights violations that has reached a number of more than 30,000 people disappeared since 2006. In the case of the disappearance of Gerson and the assassination of Alan and Miguel, están involucrados agentes estatales y no estatales e incluso de la Secretaría de la Defensa Nacional. Han participado en el encubrimiento de evidencia sensible del caso y actualmente la corrupción de los jueces para encubrir la delincuencia organizada. In the case of the disappearance of Gerson and the killing of Alan and Miguel are involved state and non-state actors, even the Secretary of Defense has participated in covering up for the evidence of this tragic case. And judges have currently also covering for, for organized crime. A raíz de ahí empieza mi lucha por tratar de encontrar a mi hijo. En la búsqueda de Gerson, conocí a otros familiares y me uní a ellos para formar nuestra organización Familiares en Búsqueda María Herrera y una red de colectivos de familiares de personas desaparecidas de todo el país llamada la Red de Enlaces Nacionales. Así, pasé, pasé de buscar solamente a mi hijo a buscar a todas las personas desaparecidas en México. De esta manera, me convertí en defensora de derechos humanos. Because of this, I began my struggle to try to find my son. While looking for Gerson, I met other families, and I, we gathered together to found our organization, Families in the Search, Maria Herrera, and a, re, a, a network of other co family collectives of people looking for their disappeared across all the country called the Network of National um, Groups. That's how I became from searching only for my son to look for many other people disappeared in Mexico. This is how I became a woman human rights defender. Desde familiares en búsqueda de María Herrera y la red de enlaces nacionales, 
he participado en acciones de búsqueda en vida y búsqueda en fosas clandestinas. En el proceso de diseño de la ley de desaparición recientemente aprobada y en el proceso de resistencia a la ley de seguridad interior, que tristemente fue aprobada hace poco. También he participado activamente en, esfuerzo, en esfuerzos organizativos para exigir un alto a la estrategia de guerra contra las drogas. From these two organizations, I have joined actions to look for the disappeared alive and also in mass graves. We, I also participated in the process to draft the general law against disappearances, which was recently approved in Congress. And we also resisted a recent law on, on interior security, a law that was sadly approved just a few months ago. I have also joined active uh, efforts to demand a stop of this war against drugs. Además de los daños de la guerra contra las, que la de, guerra contra las drogas ha significado para miles de familias que como la mía han perdido o están en búsqueda de sus seres queridos, defender los derechos humanos en este contexto es muy riesgoso. En nuestra labor de búsqueda han matado a varios compañeros como Miriam este, en Rodríguez que buscaba a su hija Karen y fue asesinada en mayo del año pasado en su casa. Y el compañero José Jesús, quien buscaba a su hija Jenny, y fue asesinada en junio del 2016. Besides the damages that this war against drugs has signified to thousands of families that, as my family, have lost their, their loved ones, or are searching for their loved ones, Defending human rights in this context, it's very, very dangerous. In our work for searching for the disappeared, many, many friends have been killed, like Miriam Elizabeth Rodriguez Martinez, who was looking for her daughter, Karen Alejandra, and was killed in May of last year at her house. Or our friend, Jose Jesus Jimenez Gaona, who was looking for her daughter, Jenny Isabel, and was killed in June 2016. La búsqueda nos vuelve incómodos para actores criminales privados, pero también para el Estado, porque evidenciamos sus omisiones y su colucción con el crimen organizado. Al organizarnos y apropiarnos de los casos de todos y todas, como si fueran nuestros desaparecidos, aumenta nuestra vulnerabilidad. The search for our loved ones makes us be uncomfortable both for, for criminal actors, but also for the state, because we evidence their omissions and their collusion with organized crime. By organizing ourselves and taking upon all the other cases, as if they are our own cases, our vulnerability increases. Por otra parte, en México, la nula reparación del daño para nosotros los familiares de las víctimas es es nula como defensores de derechos humanos. On the other hand, in Mexico it's almost zero the reparation of, of damages or, or effective remedies for victims of human of human rights violations and human rights defenders. Yo pertenezco al mecanismo de protección para defensores de derechos humanos y periodistas con una valoración de riesgo extraordinario para lo cual el mecanismo me ha destinado algunas medidas de protección, como el botón de pánico, instalación de chapas de seguridad, barrotes, sensores de movimiento, reflectores. Sin embargo, la situación de riesgo que enfrenta mi familia es muy alto, por lo que la Procuraduría General de la República suple una, suple una parte importante de las funciones del mecanismo y nos otorga escoltas como una medida adicional de seguridad, dado que las que propone el mecanismo son insuficientes. I am part of the mechanism of protection for human rights defenders and journalists that has evaluated my risk as extraordinary. The mechanism has granted me some protection me <laughs> measures, such as a panic alert, um, the installation of, of strong doors and, and windows, 
a GPS sensor and lights across my house. However, the risk situation me and my family are facing is very, very high. And that's why the Attorney General Office has been forced to, to intervene as well and to give me some police to, to protect me and my family because the measures proposed by the mechanism are insufficient. El botón de pánico es una medida privatizada que cuando lo activas te pone en contacto con una empresa. Además es insuficiente porque no tiene la capacidad de reacción adecuada. Ante una emergencia y con frecuencia el aparato no funciona. En casos de emergencia te mandan rondines de patrulla, lo cual no te protege en caso de un intento de homicidio o ataque directo. The panic alert is a privatized measure that when you activate it, it puts you in touch with a private corporation. Besides, it is inefficient because it doesn't have the capacity to react adequately and before <coughs> an emergency, and frequently the, the, the button doesn't work. Um, in emergency cases, the police would only send some people to, to police around your house, um, but they won't be able to protect you when they are trying to kill you or to <coughs> attack you directly. Sumado a esto, llegar a formar parte del mecanismo es muy complicado y necesitas el acompañamiento de una organización de la sociedad civil especializada en lidiar con el mecanismo para que tu caso sea incorporado y mantenido dentro del mecanismo y para exigir constantemente la, de, la adecuación de las medidas de protección. In addition, being able to be considered by the mechanism is very complex and you necessarily need the, the follow-up of a civil society organization that is specialized in dealing with the mechanism, just in order for the authorities to take your case into consideration and be kept within the mechanism, and to have to demand constantly that the specific measures granted are evaluated and changed according to, to the necessities. El mecanismo siempre va a ser insuficiente mientras los casos de personas defensoras agredidas sigan aumentando. El mecanismo no implementa medidas preventivas ni medidas integrales para reducir los índices de impunidad en estos ataques. Sin embargo, se mantendrá un ciclo activo de agresión a defensores de derechos humanos y periodistas. The mechanism will always be insufficient while the cases of human rights defenders attack are increasing. The mechanism does not implement measures to prevent these attacks, nor comprehensive measures to reduce the rates of impunity for these attacks. Without this, the cycle of attacks and threats against human rights defenders and journalists will definitely continue. El ciclo de impunidad y corrupción que alimenta la guerra contra las drogas no ha permitido que encontremos a todas y todos nuestros desaparecidos y pone en riesgo a quienes defendemos los derechos humanos. Por esto, es urgente cambiar la estrategia de políticas de drogas a una que garantice la protección de los derechos humanos. The cycle of impunity and corruption that fuels the war against drugs has not allowed us to find for our disappearing and, and increases the risks for those, who defend, for, for those of us who defend human rights. This is why it is urgent to need the strategy and drug control policies in Mexico towards one that guarantees the full protection of human rights. Muchas gracias por todo y comentarles que apenas en diciembre, este diciembre que pasó, pude encontrar a mi hijo, él estaba secuestrado. Gracias. Thank you very much. And I just want to share that this last December, we found the body of our son who was kidnapped for more than three years. Um, so I'm gonna give the floor now to, to Elisar Carlos from the Philippines. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Daniel. Um, warm greetings of human rights solidarity to all. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Amnesty International and the International Drug Policy Consortium for organizing uh, this important event uh, that 
uh, further enables us to bring out the truth on what is happening in the Philippines. Um, uh, I'm with the Philippine Alliance of Human Rights Advocates, and um, uh, Para is the lead convener of uh, the In Defense of Human Rights and Dignity movement, the one that first um, um, responded to the mass killings when they started even before President Duterte uh, took office in June 2016. And we're now engaged in our uh, second international um, solidarity and information tour. We uh, went all around the world last year for five months um, simply because we could not see uh, working accountability mechanisms in the Philippines and our judicial system being uh, already um, uh, under the control of this of our violent president. And yeah, uh, es essentially we're also extending the hu Philippine human rights movement which was once strong uh, outside the Philippines because of uh, the impending uh, dictatorship uh, in our country. Uh, most of you are all aware of the drug war in the Philippines operating outside the rule of law, um, which has made human life very cheap, um, the worst human rights crisis since the time of Marcos, uh, one that is dehumanizing us all. Um, as we reported uh, constantly at the UN and the US Congress, uh, President Rodrigo Duterte established a permission structure for mass murder and redefined the rules <coughs> Uh, and institutionalized the rules of and institutionalized impunity in the Philippines. Uh, he has popularized the idea that the crisis there can be solved by exterminating addicts and criminals, conditioned our police to be quick on the trigger um, and routinely circumvent due process, and have a general contempt for the rule of law <coughs> by promising them protection from litigation, uh, imposing on them forced quotas, forced results, offering bounties to even ordinary citizens, and putting up a reward system. Hitler style, he effectively dehumanized and defined drug dependents and drug peddlers as the, the inconvenient sector worthy of elimination. Uh, through sustained incitement to hate and violence, um, he has done so. No? This uh, kill society's undesired or de facto social cleansing policy has led to the deaths of at least 12,000, conservatively speaking, uh, of the most neglected, um, beaten down, and impoverished sections of uh, Philippine society, <coughs> excuse me, including children. Um, what civil society has offered, no, um, are three basic things. Uh, one, um, this includes academic institutions, international experts, and of course, human rights groups. Um, is uh, to end that clamp down prohibitionist and hardline approach, which never worked uh, elsewhere, and apply a compassionate evidence-based human rights and public health centered approach to resolving the drug issue. Of course, radical reforms in our inoperable uh, anti-poor criminal justice system so that justice can flow there. Um, and mostly is an investment in a life of dignity for all, address the root cause, in the Philippines, uh, there is a huge market of beaten down, impoverished individuals predisposed to become exploited into a life of crime and drugs. And um, uh, we would like um, essential services and opportunities to be democratized so that everyone can have a chance to get out of poverty. Um, explaining to this administration the direct relationship between the decrease of crime and drug dependency with the rise of a standard of living. Instead of consulting and listening to us, Duterte demonized us, human rights defenders, and conditioned the public to detest us. He has publicly distorted and sown misperceptions about human rights values, ideals, and principles. He has presented human rights groups as cuddlers of criminals and obstructionists of justice and obstacles to development, and promoted Sorry about that. Uh, the narrative that the world will never be safe for as long as these human rights groups are here to side with criminals, addicts, uh, and so forth. Um, the state uh, enforced um, distortion of the truth um, and um, um, hate uh, for human rights and human rights defenders has eroded public belief in human rights 
and secured some level of public acceptance should the killings um, uh, spill over our sector. Um, he has publicly threatened to kill us uh, on several occasions, ordered the police to shoot us if we obstruct justice and harvest us together with addicts, using the word harvest. Um, Duterte's message is clear. All he has to do is um, give the orders and uh, we will all uh, be killed. This situation has drastically constricted space for human rights discourse and the defense uh, of human rights in the Philippines. Um, yeah, so there's no affirmative action being undertaken to resolve the killings both by the police and um, two-thirds of the killings of um, uh, death squads, no? Um, the design, design of the drug war is, um, um, is really confi confining the violence and mass killings to the most impoverished urban poor communities, um, the lowest ranks of the drug trade, really. And the impact of the drug war uh, is several fold. No? This endangers everyone. Anyone can now be accused of being an addict or a drug pusher in the Philippines uh, without having the opportunity to go to court and defend him or herself. Um, that general contempt for the rule of law um, is leading to the breakdown of our democratic institutions. Um, it threatens to transfigure the mindsets of our entire policing establishment transforming even the most law-abiding and decent police officer into butchers. Um, now we threaten also to throw away all the human rights education work that um, the Commission on Human Rights and Human Rights Organizations have been doing. And of course, the damage to civic behavior in the Philippines. The normalization of the killings uh, is worsening our collective sociopathy. Um, Duterte, after several extensions, has finally ruled the drug war, that the drug war will continue until 2022. Um, and yeah, now is the problem is that the dormant death squad network has been unleashed uh, into an entire epidemic. So what is important now is exposing his true intentions. Um, he has no intentions whatsoever to resolve the drug issue. Um, the Philippines' war on drugs is really nothing more than a sham war used as a populist uh, tool to sow a culture of fear and silence and to advance an authoritarian agenda. It's clear to us all um, that uh, this is just um, a part of a much bigger picture. Uh, for us, it's about the falling apart of democracy and a retrogression into dictatorship and the disintegration of Philippine society. The situation today is the closest we have been to a, uh, an authoritarian government in 30 years and he's been rolling back the gains of human rights and democracy and civil and political rights having had been sub, um, sub, um, systematically eroded. Uh, he has co-opted two other branches of government and um, we have evaluated that his current priorities is two political projects, cha, -cha charter change and federalism is merely a realignment of the elite and uh, intends to dissolve nationalist, economic, and human rights provision in our constitution and do away with the democratic safeguards and checks and balances on term extension and also uh, the judicial and congressional review of martial law declaration and intends to abolish constitutional commissions such as the Commission on Human Rights. Um, he also has a well-financed propaganda machinery that is uh, effective in um, shaping public opinion, social conditioning, and re-echoing his anti-human rights and kill rhetoric. And of course, uh, online bullying and spreading a culture of intolerance to criticism and dissent. Um, he has made full use of bureaucratic and political apparatuses to carry out political persecution and silence dissent and criticism and attack through judicial harassment and misogynistic public comments, those who represent our institutions providing checks and balances, um, yeah, and his political critics, our Vice President, Senator De Lima, the Supreme Court Chief um, now facing um, uh, removal, uh, and, and of course our Ombudsperson's Chief, has been whitewashing the Marcos years and painting the Marcos years as a as the golden years. 
Um, yes, institutionalized vigilantism and forced organizing um, by yeah, forming pseudo-mass movements. These are extremist nationalist groups exploiting a distorted sense of patriotism. Um, and this has constricted space for public action for us because this uh, government-funded uh, public actions, rallies really, Hitler style, they organize in the very same spaces that we, we do, no? Um, yes, okay. Um, yes, yeah, so it, the challenge for us is enormous and unprecedented in the Philippines for human rights defenders. While being threatened as next targets, we must persevere to fight apathy, help Philippine society reestablish the respect for right to life and reclaim our collective humanity. Um, and yeah, basically, um, the difference between now and the Marcos dictatorship is during the Marcos dictatorship, um, the public was um, yeah, sympathetic with the human rights cause, but now a um, um, huge section of uh, the Philippine public detests us. Um, Duterte is still able to operate on top of a strong support base. And yeah, we lack physical and security plans amongst human rights organizations while government is actually upgrading its surveillance capacity and in infrastructure. Um, and where a lot of us are under the watch and persons of interest list of the Philippine National Police and the Armed Forces of the Philippines. So uh, the total crackdown um, uh, of uh, political activists uh, started actually and has seen this, the rise of killings of activists and the human rights defenders already. And this includes the murder of eight indigenous environmental rights defenders on the December 3 um, uh, last year. So our work now is how to expose the duplicity of the Duterte who claims to be anti-poor but really has no social agenda that will uplift the lives of the poor whose economic policies will only deepen inequality. So yeah, that's basically our role is now to make sure that our fellow Filipinos will not behave like the good Germans of the Nazi era. And of course, accountability and how to protect, provide sanctuaries for uh, the fami courageous families of victims of extrajudicial killings. So yes, thank you very much. So now we we'll give the floor to Peter from Hungary. Yeah, thank you very much. So my organization, the Rights Supporter Foundation, is based in Budapest, Hungary. Uh, we produce videos in human rights advocacy because we believe that videos are very powerful tools uh, to document human rights abuses and uh, make the drug control system more transparent and accountable and uh, to give voice to those communities who have no voice at the mainstream media. And uh, apart from producing videos ourselves now, we uh, created a, a global network for filmmakers who are producing movies on, on drug policies. And uh, you can find our online video database on Drug Reporter, our website. Uh, we also have a Russian, speak a Russian language uh, video blog, the DU News blog. Um, and, you know, I, I've been working in this field uh, since 2003, and uh, 15 years ago when I started to work, I was quite optimistic. I thought that uh, uh, in my region, in Eastern Central Europe, uh, gradually and slowly, but we will be able to close the gap, gap between uh, Western Europe and, and Eastern Europe in terms of like human rights and uh, drug policies. But unfortunately, I, I have, I have, I'm disappointed now because uh, it, it, it doesn't seem to be uh, closing this gap. But actually, there is a widening gap also in, in, in human rights and also in drug policies. Um, uh, in most of our countries, we have still very restrictive uh, drug laws. Uh, and uh, these drug laws are disproportionately affecting those people who live on the margins of society. Uh, for example, uh, Roma communities in our countries, this is an often overlooked uh, problem and uh, racial segregation and racial discrimination uh, in relation to the drug war is not only the reality in the US, but also it's a reality in, uh, in, in, in some European countries with migrants and with uh, Roma <coughs> people. And uh, in there are some areas where 90% of injecting drug users belong to uh, uh, Roma communities and uh, there is racial profiling in the police and a uh, lot of abuse. And um, uh, what we also see in our region increasingly is uh, abuse in the name of uh, treatment. So there are so-called 
rehabilitation centers who are which are uh, kidnapping people and beating them and torturing them and humiliating them uh, in the name of, uh, of drug treatment. So there is a very strong sentiment still in our society that uh, uh, people, uh, uh, people who use drugs should be humiliated in order to you know, integrate back them to the society. And um, I recommend you to watch a movie which was uh, recently produced by my uh, Russian and Ukrainian colleagues uh, forced to be healthy. It's available on uh, Drug Reporter website, and that is documenting stories of those people who were kidnapped and tortured uh, in these uh, in these centers. Um, and uh, I think that's something the international community should do. That we should uh, strongly, we, have, we should have a strong voice. That these centers should be closed. And um, uh, at the same time, there is no increasing access to uh, uh, evidence-based services in my region. Uh, what we see is that actually international donors are retreating, retreating from the region, and 90% uh, of harm reduction services, for example, are funded were funded by international donors. So we could uh, document uh, uh, in many countries the collapse of harm reduction systems in previous years um, uh, and closing down of, of, of life-saving uh, programs. In my own country, Hungary, the two largest needle and syringe programs were closed down a few years ago, uh, uh, which were providing 50% of, of clean needles uh, in the country, and it resulted in a, in a huge outbreak of hepatitis C epidemic uh, in my country. And, uh, and it happened in, in, in other countries of the region. Uh, so that's, that's also something which uh, we, should, uh, we should address. And uh, in, in, in Russia, uh, uh, methadone treatment is still, uh, still illegal. And um, when Russia invaded uh, uh, Crimea, then uh, hundreds of people died because their, uh, their treatment was interrupted. Um, and uh, now some of our Russian colleagues are uh, suing the Russian government at the Strasbourg Human Rights Court, uh, challenging the, the illegality of, of, of methadone. So uh, we have very brave and strong activists from, from the region who are standing up and uh, try to uh, uh, protect their rights. Unfortunately, there is a strong backlash from the government. For example, one of our partners, the Andrei Rilkov Foundation, which is a harm reduction NGO providing needles uh, for drug users in Moscow, their website was banned by the government just because they were promoting uh, a methadone uh, substitution treatment. And now we have to host their website from Hungary because they are not able to do it from Russia. Um, and. Uh, and um, on, on, on top of the drug war, now what we see is a, is a, is a crackdown on, on civil society uh, organizations. So first, Russia introduced the foreign agent rule. Probably most of you heard about that. So that requires uh, NGOs that receive foreign funding and that are condemned of as, you know, as, uh, as polit polit policy advocate advocacy organizations to register as uh, foreign agents. So this is like uh, stigmatizing these NGOs and uh, scapegoating uh, these NGOs uh, and making them uh, responsible for all bad, all, all bad uh, things in, in society. And uh, unfortunately, now more and more countries are uh, importing this Russian-style foreign agent laws, including my own country, Hungary, which uh, also introduced uh, uh, a version of this foreign agent law, and it applies to us as well. So all NGOs who receive foreign funding have to register, uh, and, uh, and, um, and that's kind of you know, stigmatizing the, the NGOs. Uh, but together with other NGOs, now we're challenging this law. Uh, we uh, submitted a complaint to the, uh, to the uh, Constitutional Court of Hungary, and we also challenged the law at the Strasbourg uh, Human Rights uh, Court. Uh, and the European Commission also uh, initiated an investigation against Hungary. But it seems that our government does not learn from this mistake because now they are uh, actually uh, introduced a second bill. Uh, they call it Stop Soros, Stop Soros uh, Law, which is actually directly uh, against uh, George Soros and the NGOs who are funded by George Soros, uh, saying that actually George Soros is, is kind of like uh, uh, conspiring against Hungary and, um, and uh, try to undermine Hungarian, Hungary's uh, international role. And, um, 
the government also launched a, a huge billboard poster campaign. So you can see these posters all over Hungary. In, in even, even the smallest villages are full with these posters with the picture of George Soros uh, being uh, depicted as, you know, the, the, the devil actually, you know. And um, in, in this environment, uh, NGOs who uh, try to do some advocacy work, it's, it's really bad, it's really hostile environment. Uh, and uh, that's, that also affects drug policy, like uh, those, those uh, uh, NGOs who, who try to provide just services are also affected by this chilling effect of, of, this, uh, of this very negative campaign. So um, when, when, you know, Václav Havel, the, the, the famous Czech dissident, uh, uh, after the fall of communism said that uh, that uh, a totalitarian system can coexist with a capitalist market and it can also coexist with uh, parliamentary elections but it cannot coexist with a vibrant and free civil society so uh, I think that, that that's really key not only to make uh, good drug policies but also uh, also just to maintain democracy to keep uh, civil society free and uh, uh, what is the message to, uh, to, to those countries who are more advanced in democracy and uh, international donors is please don't let down the human rights defenders in our region. Please don't uh, retreat from the region and please keep funding uh, uh, service providers and also advocacy NGOs because uh, what, uh, what, is the, what is sometimes the most difficult in this situation is that we are scapegoated because we use international funds, but there are less and less uh, international support. So as, as Martin Luther King said, uh, in the end you will remember, not remember the, the words of your enemies, but the silence of your friends. So you should, uh, I think the international community, community has a lot to do in, in this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the three panelists. Uh, we still have around 10 minutes, so we, we will open the floor for, for some questions or, or comments. Uh, please be very concise so we can bring the most uh, comments and questions on board. So whoever has a, a question. Yep. Hi. Um, Christine Mehta with Positions for Human Rights. I have a question for Mr. Elisir, actually. Um, I wondered if you could expand a little bit on some of the methods that the Filipino government is using to target activists. Um, I know, for example, that they've already gone after the Commission on Human Rights by slashing their budget to about $20 USD. So I'm wondering if, you know, for activists out in civil society space, whether there are also similar tactics being used, like going after foreign sources of funding um, for local activists, as well as criminal charges, and if not currently, do you see the risk increasing for those <coughs> kinds of tactics to be used? Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Amnesty, for for organizing this event and IDPC. It's uh, an opinion about the, the Colombia situation, please. Um, you know, according with the National Ombudsman, during the last two years, were murdered almost 300 people, human rights defenders in my country. And one woman is killed each two months there. In 2016, in Colombia, was signed a peace agreement that included a point about drugs. This accord is focusing in the rural communities involved in the cultivation of the cross, in their re in the rigs, and the improve of their life. Despite the peace agreement, during the last year, almost 14 campesinos were murdered in the framework of the forced eradication organized by the, by the national government against poor communities like massive murders occurred in last October 5. Only in the first two months of the 2018 were murdered 10 people involved in the crop substitution process, according with the monitoring 
of the observ observatory of the global that I like, I work. Between 2017 and 2018, the data goes up to 13.4. Implicates in this were the armed, the armed forces, paramilitary groups, and guerrillas too. We claim that the responsibility for the protect families committed with the peace process and the crop substitution is the state. Thank you, Daniel. Anyone else? Well, or, well I'll give the microphone to, to the other folks. Um, thank you so much for that uh, good question. Um, well, essentially, uh, the, the budget of the CHR was, um, yeah, was we intended to slash it, but um, uh, Congress did return it. It was uh, really a demonstration of power on Duterte's uh, part. No? Um, he's been harassing the Commission on Human Rights ever since, and uh, through charter change, he intends to um, dissolve this institution together with other institutions that provide checks and balances. And so we're, we're really um, uh, very, very um, um, on our toes with respect to this issue, charter change and federalism. Um, I can't mention the organization, but there's this organization that actually is now tagged to be uh, supporting um, the left. Um, and they had um, a big conference, and uh, the budget of this was actually um, uh, stopped by government. No? Um, and actually, um, uh, the um, donor, uh, the, the country of the donor institution was actually... Um, um, spoken to by, by government, their embassy in China. And um, um, uh, they said, don't you know that, um, that one of your institutions uh, in your country is actually supporting a terrorist organization? And so, um, yeah, uh, about uh, three days ago, four days ago, um, the Department of Justice released 600 individuals um, that they claim to be um, connected to the left and declared them as terrorists. Uh, that includes the special rapporteur on uh, IPs, indigenous people. Um, and yeah, judicial harassment is, has uh, become quite common in the context of the crackdown. And of course, uh, Upland Kapayapan, the counterinsurgency uh, program of Duterte. Um, um, of course, the incitement uh, to hate and violence against human rights defenders and um, yeah, essentially there's a new law that came out uh, while we were sleeping that was um, um, yeah, inconspicuously done, no? uh, traitor style. Um, RA 10973, uh, where the Philippine National Police Chief can actually summon anyone in Philippine society uh, without judicial approval. And yeah, it's... Um, more or less uh, pending martial law, it's uh, more or less becoming a uh, police state anyway. We have time for one last question, if someone, Isabel. Okay, so I'm gonna do my question in uh, Spanish because it's for Marisela, and then Daniel will translate. Marisela, uh, quería preguntar si nos pudieras contar más de las comisiones de búsqueda que hacen los familiares y los riesgos que tienen los familiares para hacer estas comisiones de manera independiente o las garantías que pueden tener para hacer esas búsquedas. So Isabel was asking about the commissions for searching for the disappeared and what guarantees they have um, for, for being able to do that work. Eh, nosotros empezamos con las búsquedas en fosas clandestinas. Eh, la gente por anónimos nos decían dónde creían que habían cuerpos y empezamos a buscar una desobediencia hacia el gobierno porque le pedíamos que fueran a buscar y ellos no querían. Así que nosotros los familiares nos organizamos y fui, empezamos a buscar en fosas. Y sí, hemos encontrado muchísimos cuerpos. Y de hecho, el cuerpo de mi hijo que apenas apareció eh, en esa fosa, que es la más grande creo que de, del mundo que ha aparecido, o por lo menos de mi país, se, encontraron, se han encontrado 284 cuerpos. ¿Y cómo lo hacemos? Empezamos con una varilla a estar enterrando en la tierra 
la sacábamos y la olíamos. Y cuando huele horrible es que hay cuerpos. Y pues como les digo, ahí encontré, ahí se encontró el de mi hijo. Y aún así el juez eh, niega que haya delincuencia organizada en Veracruz. Um, so we began first looking at mass graves, uh, following tips from anonymous people who told us they, they felt there were bodies um, in there. Uh, so as a form of civil disobedience um, to the reluctant government for, for going and searching at those sites, the families organized themselves and we found several, several bodies that were, that were um, in, in, in those um, terrains. Um, actually, the, the body of my son was in one of those mass graves. Um, it's actually one of the biggest mass graves that we know, if not globally, at least in my country. We found 284 bodies um, that were um, in, in, the, in that mass grave. And despite this, um, the judge in Veracruz, the, the city where Maricela is from, is still denying that there's organized crime in the state. Um, so, well, um, sadly we are running out of time. Um, I want to thank you all for, for joining us, the amazing panelists, for, for sharing your studies with us today and, and th for the amazing work that you're doing on the ground. Uh, just to close that, um, to say, that it's clear that for, from three very different regions in the world, we are seeing the same patterns, the same trends of threats and attacks against human rights defenders, of how governments are directly stigmatizing human rights defenders, not only people who use drugs who have for many, many years been stigmatized and scapegoated, but now all, all, also those people who are working to defend those rights are being stigmatized and scapegoated. We are seeing these huge attack around the world with undue restrictions to the rights to freedom of expression, freedom of peaceful assembly and freedom of as associations. In countries that were usually the champions of human rights, we are also seeing these attacks. So we're seeing this huge challenge. Uh, we are seeing direct threats and attacks against human rights defenders who have found themselves at these attacks. So we urge both Vienna-based bodies, delegations here, and the international community in general to keep this discussion ongoing. We, we are certain that, that the, the process towards 2019 and beyond offers this opportunity to raise these amazing stories, to, pro to increase the visibility of these human rights defenders that are at risk, and to push states to actually commit to their obligations to protect the work of these human rights defenders. Um, so thank you very much to all for, for joining us, and, and thanks to, to the amazing human rights defenders. Thank you.